Hello, welcome to this video on short run, long run costs and diminishing returns. So in this video, we're going to look at the relationship between short run and long run costs. And we're going to look at deriving cost curves from the assumption of diminishing marginal productivity. And bear with me, we'll pick this apart as we go through the video. So as we know in economics, we have the factors of production. And these are the inputs that are available to firms to combine to generate goods and services that people want. Now, if we're thinking now about the short run and the long run, what we assume as economists is that in the short run, at short run, at least one of the factors is fixed. So if you think about all our factors of production, we're assuming here in the short run there's going to be a limit to the amount of one of these factors of production and normally that's going to be capital so say we have a factory or machines we might have one machine one factory and that's fixed in the short one we can add uh, raw materials we can add workers but the amount of capital is going to be fixed it could also be land so in the short run businesses are constrained with fixed and variable factors typically fixed factors the difference we assume in the long run is that all factors of production are variable and the scale of production can also change, allowing the firm to benefit from economies of scale. So we assume here in the long run that we can add more factories, add more capital, add capital. Nothing is fixed and finite in its amounts. We should just note that the length of the short run will vary by industry. So short run production is a period in time when at least one factor of production is in fixed supply. A business has chosen its scale of production, so its size, we've chosen one factory or we've chosen two factories or one piece of machinery, and we stick with this in the short run period. We can't suddenly become a lot bigger or a lot smaller. We assume often that the quantity of plant and machinery is fixed and that production can be altered within some variables by changing variable inputs such as labor, raw materials and energy, but we can't change the fundamental amount of capital. So our machinery and our factories, for example. So we often talk about two types of factor input, um, or there are often two types of fa factor input, fixed and variable, and often the ones that we say are in short supply, the fixed factor inputs are capital and land. In the short run then, how much a firm produces or its productivity is very closely linked to the workers and labor. Now we're gonna look at what we mean by the term diminishing returns. So in the short run, at least one factor of production is fixed, normally capital, but can also be land. The law of diminishing returns states that as more units of a variable input are added, to fixed amounts of land and capital, the change in total output will first rise and then fall. So this is an important concept for us to think about here. So let's make sure we have this one down. The law of diminishing returns states that as, as we add more units of a variable input, so perhaps as we add more workers to use our machine, initially, we have a rise in total output. But then ultimately, if we keep on doing this, add more and more workers, we might have a fall in total output. And this phenomena is called the law of diminishing returns. Let's look at some examples. So you might think about teaching in a lesson and your teacher is standing at the front and they've been talking for Let's say in the first instance, they've been talking for five minutes and you get a lot of information. You think this is really great. Five minutes in, I really hear what you're saying. After 35 minutes, well, you're starting to feel a bit bored. The value of everything the teacher is saying, is starting to become a bit monotonous, a bit boring. What time is it? You're starting to move. After 55 minutes, actually, you're not learning anything more. You're actually so angry the teacher's still talking, you're forgetting the stuff they covered at the start of the lesson. So here, the initial use of teacher's time has a large benefit, and then that starts to decline as you get bored, and by the end, you're so annoyed 
that you've started to actually forget stuff. You might have heard the phrase, too many cooks spoil the broth. That's another example of diminishing returns. So we have the first chef who adds something to the broth and that makes it taste better. We might even have the second chef who's added something to the broth. And again, it might taste better, but maybe not quite as better. The impact might have diminished slightly. By the time this chap on the right has stuck in all sorts of chili powder and salt and pepper, actually, he's made the broth worse than in the starting place. So here we've seen, uh, if we were to sort of plot it out, an increase in the taste of the soup from the first chef, then it's plateaued with the second chef, and by the time we get to the third chef, actually he's ruined it. And so here we get a little, little graph, and we can say that as we add more chefs, our soup gets worse. The returns of adding more people to the fixed soup, the fixed pot, the capital, gets worse. A final example. Let's imagine we have one tractor and no workers. If we were to add the first worker to our tractor, then this might have a benefit. They might be able to harvest maybe 10 bales of hay. Then we add our second worker. And actually, there might be a really good benefit because now we can have one worker gathering the hay whilst the other worker is putting it into the back of the tractor. And so let's say the output goes up to 22. So this worker has actually increased output by 12. Then we add a third worker and output goes up to 30. Okay, that worker wasn't quite so useful, but we're still increased. By the time we try and introduce the sixth worker, we find that actually they're all squabbling to get on the tractor. They can't fit. It's not really going to go anywhere. And actually output has gone back down to 15. So the impact of this last worker here is actually to reduce the returns. There'd be negative returns from the introduction of this extra worker. So this is what we mean by the marginal product of labor. How much extra does an extra worker add? So the marginal product of labor is the additional return generated from adding an extra worker. Here's a quick example. On the left hand side, we can see the number of employees number of workers employed and we can see one two three four five six then we can see the output so if you have one worker output will be how many would produce eight units if it's two workers 20 units and so on then we have marginal product and average product so let's have a look here the marginal product of labor the extra product from adding one worker well from going from one to two output has gone from eight to 20 so we've added 12 so the marginal product of labor here is 12. When we add another worker, we go to three workers, we go from 20 to 36, the marginal product here, well, that worker has added 16. In the column further, the next column to the right, we can see the average product. So here, if we have three workers and between them, they produce 36 units, the average product is 12. And so what's happening here in terms of the returns to extra labor? Well, here, as we add workers two and workers three, it's rising. It's gone from eight to 12 and then from 12 to 16. So we're getting an extra return from adding more people. What happens once we add the fourth person? Well, actually, we add on 12. But that's not as much as it was previously 16. So the returns are diminishing. And we can see when we add on the fifth person, it goes down to eight. And we add on the sixth person it goes down to five. So they're diminishing. At some point here, actually, by adding the uh, fifth and sixth people, we're bringing down the average product. The amount of product that's being made per person is actually starting de to decrease when the marginal product drops below the current average. So when diminishing returns set in, the marginal product of labor starts to fall. OK, we're adding extra workers, but they're not adding as much impact every time. When the marginal product of labor declines below the existing average product, then the average product, the average product of labor, what each worker produces on average, will start to fall. And we can see here that that occurs when we add the fifth and sixth worker in our example. So how does this then link to cost? Well, if the returns from each extra worker are falling, then each extra worker must be increasing, adding 
are costs and they are less a cost of effective than the previous worker. So if I hire an extra worker and actually they're only producing eight more units and the previous worker produced 10 more units, the relative cost of that extra worker is higher. So it's going to lead to an increase in costs. So as returns decrease, as the marginal product of labor falls, costs increase and vice versa. So our short run law of diminishing returns, a quick summary and recap to see where this is taking us. In the short run, at least one factor of production is fixed, normally capital. So our tractor, for example, it can also be land or any other um, factor of production. And as we add more units of a variable input to that fixed amount, so as we add more workers to that tractor, the change in total output will first rise and then eventually fall. Diminishing returns to labor occur when marginal product of labor starts to fall, as we saw in the previous example. This means that total output will be increasing, but at a decreasing rate. So here's a good example of what we're talking about. As we add more people, the marginal product of labor is positive. We get uh, an accelerating gradient. Then there comes a stage where actually by employing more people, total output is going up, but it's slowing down. And here we have diminishing returns. Each extra worker is not adding as much total output. Here we have our point of maximum yield. It's the maximum we can produce given our fixed capital in the short run. And then eventually if we keep adding workers, they get in each other's way, we might get negative returns. So we've looked at the relationship here between the short run and the long run. And now we're going to tie this assumption here we've made about diminishing marginal returns, diminishing marginal productivity into the impact on costs. So this is why we have a U-shaped marginal cost curve. Initially, we get uh, increasing returns. So we can see that as returns increase, the relative cost of employing each extra worker starts to fall. But then we get to a point where actually adding each extra worker, because the marginal productivity falls and they're adding less and less total output, the relative cost of increasing the adding those workers means that the cost of each additional worker starts to rise. And so we get initially a fall in marginal cost when marginal product is increasing. And then when marginal product starts to fall, we get a rise in marginal cost. So we get this U-shaped uh, marginal cost curve, and this is how we always draw it. How does that then relate to our average cost curve? Well, remember, whilst the cost of each additional unit is below the current average, this will have the impact of bringing our average down. Like if we have the average height in a class and we keep adding people who are below the current average height, the average height in the class will come down. But as the marginal cost continues to rise, this effect wears off and the average cost curve starts to level out to the point where the marginal cost equals the average cost. Once the marginal cost starts to rise above the average, this has the impact of pulling the average up. So we will always see this shape. The marginal cost is a U, a U curve, and then the AC curve, we always know that it will intersect the marginal cost at its lowest point. So in this video, we've looked at the relationship between short run and long run costs. We've investigated this concept of diminishing marginal productivity and diminishing returns. And we've looked at how that gives rise to our marginal cost curve and our average cost curve. That's it. Thanks very much for listening.